Hi folks, my name's Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. Ooh, that's a different start than most of my videos, isn't it? For you folks that see my coffee chats, this ain't a coffee chat. And for you folks that come here for homesteading, which is what this channel's supposed to be all about, this ain't homesteading. This is a Christmas present. This video is a Christmas present. It's a Christmas present for all of the alcoholics like me out there that haven't been lucky enough to get back to where I am, and that is a recovering alcoholic. It's for all the alcoholics out there who over time have dug and dug and dug their hole and have dug it so deep that they don't think they can come out of it. It's for all the alcoholics who have found their bottom and most alcoholics have spent at least one or two days going to AA, go in sober, go back the next time drunk. <laughs> you know what your bottom is. And there's a lot of people that find their bottom and think there's no way out of there. And this is a Christmas, this video is a Christmas present for them. <sighs> that there is hope. It's also a Christmas present for the people who have to put up with us, us alcoholics when we're still drinking. Because that can be pure hell. I'm on my third marriage. First one was a mistake to start with. I'm not going to get into that one. Second one, I've got two sons, one of which I haven't seen 15 years except for five minutes last January. Came to the hospital after my surgery. Stayed for about five minutes. I hadn't seen him in about 15 years before that. Another son that I've got a good relationship with. I drank that marriage away. Um, let me back up. I want to tell y'all a little story about a drunk. A drunk named Bob. How you get to where you are. And how you can get out of where you are if you're still down there. And I'm not real sure about the lighting. It looks like my face is lit up decently. Looks like I'm way too overlit here. It doesn't matter. That's not the point of this video anyway. I want to tell you about a fellow that when he was in his teens, I'm from Georgia. And in Georgia, when I was in my teens, the drinking age was 18 years old. And I'm going to tell you all right now, I think the drinking age still ought to be 18 years old. If 18 is old enough to put a gun in a man's hand, send him overseas and ask him to take a chance on getting killed, he's old enough to have a beer before he goes. That's not the point of this video either. Drinking age was 18, and I took advantage of that. And um, actually, I, <laughs> I looked 40 from the time I was about 16 years old on up until I was past 40. Uh, so I could walk in a bar when I was 16 years old, a bar that did not serve minors. I could walk in a bar when I was 16 years old and order a drink and get served, and I did. Uh, drank pretty good when I was 18, 20, 22 years old. I, I could put it away. I don't think I had to. I, I don't think I was an alcoholic. I, pro I was an abusive drinker because I got drunk a lot. But I wasn't an alcoholic. What's an alcoholic? An alcoholic is somebody that doesn't drink because they want to. It's somebody that drinks because they got to. And I don't know when I crossed that line. I don't know when I went from abusive drinker to alcoholic. I think it was probably in my 30s, late 30s, 40s, somewhere in there. And I was a functioning alcoholic. I'd never missed a day's work. Did a good job when I worked for somebody. I built a couple of successful businesses. Um, 
I was a functioning alcoholic. I started knowing I had to do something long about 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. Didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but I knew I had to do something. I knew I had a problem. I knew I had a serious problem. But this video, I want to tell y'all just where you can start, where you can wind up, and where you can come back to. I'm the son of a career Air Force officer. Uh, he'd be, if he was still alive, he'd be a hundred years old back in October. Instead, he died when he was 49, drunk. Um, I grew up good. Probably what would be considered upper middle class. Father was an officer in the Air Force, went in and 1941, start of World War II, as an enlisted person back in the Army Air Corps, back when they let sergeants fly. Got out after World War II, went back in, got recalled for Korea, stayed in after that. The people that they recalled for Korea that had been NCOs, they told them if they'd stay in, they'd make them an officer. He stayed in and decided he's going to go for 30 years. And when he had 20 years, they stuck, took his wings away. Stuck him behind a desk, flying a desk for a strategic air command. And uh, when they took his wings away, he started hitting the bottle really bad. And his life, he also decided he wasn't going to put in 30 years. He got out at 26. His last five years in the Air Force, he was drunk. He lived for five years. He retired in 1964, lived until 1969. He was drunk that last five years. He was alive after he got out, too. And I sort of followed in his footsteps. But I, all that's to tell you, I came up good. I was an upper middle class, went to private schools, uh, went to whatever, college of my choice. I mean, I had everything. Um, I had everything. I had every opportunity to do whatever I wanted to do. I went from that to, in 2004 is when I got really serious about stopping drinking. I knew I had to. <clears throat> I knew there was only three places I could go if I kept drinking. I was either going to go to jail or I was going to go to a mental institution or I was going to go to the grave. Those are my three choices, and I was aware enough to know it. See, in, 19, in 2003, I went from being a functioning alcoholic who could work every day and do his job right to not being able to work. Um, I started having heart attacks in, in 2003. Well, actually, I had one back in 1990. But then I didn't have any more problems after that until 2003, and I just started clicking off heart attacks. And between the heart attacks and the stents, uh, at this point, and this wasn't in 2003, but at this point I got 10 stents. Um, and diabetes, and COPD, and just a bunch of other minor health things that any one of which is not a big deal but they all added up to where I was done working. See when I was working I couldn't drink till about six o'clock in the afternoon when I got off because I did a good job. Every job I had I did a good job. I had driving jobs. I drove a truck for a while, a long time, eight years. Didn't drive drunk. Ran heavy equipment, didn't run it drunk. Like I said, started a couple of businesses, real successful businesses, very successful businesses. And you can't do that when you're drunk. So I didn't drink till I'd get off in the evening. Well, 2003, when I couldn't work anymore, all of a sudden I could drink whenever I wanted to. 
I didn't have to stay sober for a job. And I was starting about 4.30 in the morning. And I never have been much of a beer drinker. I'd drink beer if I was fishing. I'd drink a beer if I was mowing the lawn, which I try to avoid. I absolutely abhor yard work. But uh, I drank hard liquor from my teenage years. When I was young, it was bourbon and coke. And at about 40, 45 years old, I decided I loved gin and tonics. And I'll tell you right now, this day, I love the taste of gin and tonic. I wish I could drink it. If Coca-Cola ever comes out with a drink that tastes like, uh, preferably, Bombay Sapphire and tonic, all y'all that buy it will be profit because I'll cover their expenses because I'll be buying a bunch of it because I love gin and but it has to be non-alcoholic. Because I absolutely love gin and tonic, especially Bombay Sapphire. Of course, toward the end, I wasn't drinking Bombay Sapphire because you can't afford it when you drink as much as I did. I got to the point where I was drinking a half a gallon of gin every single day, seven days a week. I decided I had to do something, and I didn't have a clue what to do. But where this, uh, what y'all need to understand, what you drunks out there need to understand is not just that I knew I had to do something, but how I got to where I had to do something. See, I used to go to the liquor store every morning. I'd still be sort of sober. Not really sober, but sort of sober, because I'd have, I'd have a drink in the morning when I got up. I'd always save myself the night before, I'd save myself about that much gin in the bottle of about a half gallon of gin. And that was for the next morning until the liquor store opened at 9 o'clock. And 9 o'clock, I'd be sitting at the liquor store. I'd get my half gallon of gin, two packs of Marlboro Lights, and I'd go up to a grocery store we have here in town, or had here in town, it went bankrupt, uh, Blue Star here in Jasper, Georgia, and they sold tonic water. One day I was in Blue Star. So you go in, you go in the door over there on the right hand side of the building, and go up past you know the row of cash registers. You go past the cash register, turn left, go over there, and there was dairy over there on the on the coolers over there on the far wall. But then the gondolas facing the dairy, right along there, was where all their drinks were, Coca Colas and all that sort of thing. Just as you turn that corner, right down there on the bottom six packs of tonic water. That's where I got my tonic water from a gin and tonic. Now you gotta understand I was drunk every day. Every day. Um, I used to wake up out in the yard where I'd passed out out in the yard. I used to wake up laying on the living room floor where I'd passed out in the living room and didn't make it to the couch. I got real good at falling down, I'll tell you that. I could be a stunt double for somebody in a movie that had to fall down and not get hurt because I was a, I'm a pro at that. I've done enough of that, I'm a pro. And I'd been going, I know I'm getting this out of order, but let me back up a little bit. I'd been going to AA. Uh, anybody that's been to AA knows their poker chip deal. When you come in, you get a white chip white chip means you're coming in you've decided to get sober and they have red chips and blue chips and yellow chips and the longer the more sobriety you have then you get the next color well folks I never could get past a white chip the meetings here in Jasper Monday Wednesday Friday and Monday I'd show up and get a white chip and Wednesday I'd show up drunk Friday I'd show up and get a white chip and Monday I'd show up drunk Wednesday I'd get a white chip and Friday I'd show up drunk. I got enough white chips to tile a bathroom. But anyway, I, I had known I needed to get sober. I had to get sober because I knew I was going to die if I didn't. But I just couldn't figure out how to do it. 
And one day I was in Blue Star. I'd gotten my half a gallon of gin. And I was in Blue Star getting my two six packs of tonic water. And I was dressed like I am now, sort of. I had on, had on Liberty overalls. Probably had on a gray pocket t-shirt. That's all I wore back then was gray pocket t-shirts. And I was squatting down. Overalls probably wore out. Probably had holes in the knees. Because I really didn't care back then. I, I cared about one thing. I was making sure I had booze. And I was squatting down to get my two six packs of tonic water because they were down there on the bottom shelf. And coming around the corner was a lady with a buggy and a baby sitting up in the child seat in the buggy. And her little boy, he's probably three, four, five years old. I'm, I'm lousy at judging age of little kids. I'm gonna say he was about four years old. And they came around the corner and behind me and a regular size supermarket. We're not talking about a convenience store. And they got down there about to where the milk was and mom stopped to get a gallon of milk. And I'm not paying any attention to them, really. And I'm getting my tonic water. And I hear this little five-year-old boy. He looked up at his mama. Well, I guess he looked up. I wasn't looking down that way. But he said, Mama, she said, what? He said, that man stinks. Folks, I was the only one on that aisle. I was the only, I, I think she and I were the only ones in the store that didn't work there. Remember how I said I was brought up. The reason I stunk was I probably hadn't had a bath in three or four weeks. It was summer. It was hot. A little old boy walks by and I smell bad enough that he tells his mama, Mommy, that man stinks. about how I was brought up. Upper middle class upbringing. Here I am, hadn't had a bath in three or four weeks. Didn't care that I hadn't had a bath in three or four weeks. If I hadn't had a bath in three or four weeks, I was probably wearing the same clothes for the whole three or four weeks. Can you imagine what my clothes looked like? That little boy saved my life. I had known before I needed to get sober. But when a little five-year-old boy tells his mama that you stink, all of a sudden you can't deny that it's having an effect on the world around you. I didn't want little four or five year old boys thinking I stunk. Now I, I'm I'm one of those people who tell you you can't get sober for nobody but yourself. You can't get sober for your wife, your marriage, your kids, your job, because if you get sober for any of those things and you lose them, if your wife divorce you, divorces you, if you kids get taken away, if you lose your job, well, you've just lost your reason for being sober, so you'll go back to drinking. And I tell people all the time, you can only get sober for yourself. So that little five-year-old boy pushed me, but I decided I had to get sober for me because I didn't want to be that man that stunk when a little boy walked by. Put myself in rehab. Now, it's not over yet. I put myself in rehab, got sober. I stayed sober for four years. I was 
It's over until 2008. 2008 was not a good year. My house burned down, but that wasn't a bad part of the year. 2008, I relapsed. I decided in February that I knew more than those people down there at rehab knew because they told me if I ever took another drink, I'd be within a couple of weeks, I'd be right back to where I was before, half a gallon a day. And I thought they were full of crap. Because not drinking was easy. I mean, it truly was. I didn't have cravings. I liked gin and tonic, and I missed the gin and tonic for the taste and just, I liked gin and tonic. But not drinking was easy, and I figured if it's so easy to not drink, I can just, I can have a gin and tonic before dinner and then just not drink. You know those folks at rehab, smart folks? Because in February I started having a drink before dinner. And it took me just about what they said, about two weeks, and I was back to a half a gallon a day. And uh, started digging that hole again. Tell you where you wind up, if you don't die, if you don't wind up in the mental institution. You know, I told you that third place was jail. Well, when I relapsed, on 10 o'clock in the morning, on November 7th, 2008, I decided I had to go pay my power bill. Now, why in the world I would do that, I don't know. Had a debit card in my pocket, had money in the bank, I could call and pay it on the phone, but no, I decided I had to go drive to the Georgia Power and pay my power bill. Problem is, a school bus got in the way. Yeah, I'm one of those scumbags you read about in the paper that hits the school bus. Drunk. It was a super minor wreck. There were no kids on the bus. The bus was doing about five miles an hour and I was doing about five miles an hour. Pickup truck I was driving sitting right out there now. You can hardly tell it's been in a wreck. They fixed the school bus. My insurance company fixed the school bus because <laughs> it was a brand new school bus. It didn't have 500 miles on it yet. Never been in, been in trouble in my life, and I go hit and, and hit a school bus. I'd never gotten DUI. Well, I'll take that back. I said 2008 was a bad year. Ten days before I hit school bus, I got a DUI. I hadn't even been to court on it yet, and then I hit school bus. So when I went to court, I had two DUIs all rolled up into one case. But I'd never been in trouble in my life. I've been a drinker since I was in my teens. I've driven drunk a lot. I was good at it. I've driven through DUI checkpoints. Roll down the window. Can you see your driver's license? Sure. Anything to drink? Yeah, I've had a beer. Act fine and have a good day, Mr. Hales, and send me on. Be drunker than a skunk. I'd never been in trouble in my life. And then I hit that school bus. I'd never been in jail in my life, and then I did 90 days for that. Prosecutor wanted two years. He was kind of PO'd that I'd hit a school bus, and I don't blame him. I pled guilty to both DUIs. I was guilty. Wasn't anything to argue about. I could have beaten the first one. The second one I couldn't have beaten. I didn't even try and beat the first one. I was guilty. I was driving drunk. All of this. I've been talking for what, about 25 minutes now? All of this is for you drunks out there that think you've dug a hole so deep that you can't come back from your bottom. I dug a hole to where I was homeless. My house had burned down. 
had two DUIs facing me, drinking a half a gallon of gin every single day that rolled around from a minor wreck, wind up in the hospital for two weeks, being told I was going to die every day for the first five days that I wouldn't see the next day because I had screwed my body up so bad with booze. When I got out of jail, 90, two weeks in the hospital and from the hospital I went to jail. The wreck was on November 7th. I walked out of jail December 29th. Yeah, they give you a day and a half. Every day, every day you're in, you get a day and a half if you're a good boy. And I was so sick I couldn't do anything. I spent the whole time in the infirmary in the jail. No matter how deep a hole you dig, no matter how far down in your bottom is and you're there, don't think you can't come back. Am I rich now? No. I'm just a toothless redneck pig farmer. But you know what? I've got 11 years sober. Last month, November 7th, was 11 years since I've had a drink. I can't say I won't have a drink tomorrow. One day at a time is how you do it. But no matter how low you go, because remember, I didn't have anything when I got out of jail. My house had burned. I had nothing. I had the clothes on my back and a little bit of money in the bank. I now have a home. Not a house. I've got a home. Two and a half acres up here in the mountains of North Georgia. Raised pigs. Raised cattle over at my father-in-law's place. A town about 25 miles away. I'm not rich. Matter of fact, by most standards, I'm poor. But I'm the richest person I know. Because of the life I've got. Because I'm sober. You can get out of that hole don't lose faith you can get out of that hole and let me tell you something about faith faith is how you can get out of that hole yeah faith faith in God see I asked God through the whole time back 2000 when I first decided I needed to get sober all the way up through going to rehab. God, I see, I've always believed in God, and I've always believed in Christ as a Savior. But it was sort of a superficial thing, because I relied on one verse in the Bible, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, and that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that who gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but of everlasting life. Well, cool. I've got that covered. I believe in him. Check that off. I'm good to go. Now, you need to do a little bit more than that. But I'd pray. I ask God, where are you? I thought you'd help me if I asked. And I'm, I'm sitting here sinking. Tell you something. God gives you free will. Every step you take of every day that goes by, do you know where God is? He's standing right there. He's standing right beside you. He takes every step with you. Every single step. He won't make you do anything. If you need to go to rehab, God won't make you go to rehab. That's your decision. It's a free choice. But he's always right there. Don't ever ask him, where were you? Because he's always right there. You just have to do one thing. Besides standing right there beside you, know, you know what else God's doing? He's holding his hand out. He won't take your hand. He will not grab your hand and make you follow him. He will not grab your hand and make you have faith. But if you'll take his hand, he'll help you out. And 
you can get out of that hole. I've, none of you have dug a hole any deeper than I have. You may have dug as deep as I have, but you've never dug deeper. And you can get out of that hole. So don't lose faith in him. Don't say you're so far gone, you're irredeemable. Don't say that you can't come back. And you family members and you friends and you employers, uh, if anybody is watching this, if you're not the drunk that this video is intended for, you know a drunk that it's intended for. I don't think there's a soul out there that can say they not only are they not an alcoholic, but they don't know anybody with an addiction problem. And I'm talking about drugs too, not just alcohol. See, an alcoholic's an addict. A lot of old school alcoholics will tell you, well, at least I'm not a drug addict. Well, hell yes, you are. Alcohol is a mind-altering drug, just as much as cocaine or heroin or crack or anything else. So don't get all sanctimonious and say, well, I'm, uh, I'm just an alcoholic, I'm not an addict. Yeah, you're an addict, you're a drug addict. There's not a soul out there that if you're not an alcoholic, if you're not an addict, you at least know somebody that is. All you wives love your husband, hate that he's a drunk. All you employers, you got a, somebody working for you that does a good job for you, but you know they're like me, they're functioning alcoholics, and when they go home, they're drunk. All you kids, young people, love your mama or love your daddy. And just hate seeing that they're drunk. Or doing drugs. They can get out of that hole. You drunks, you can get out of that hole. If I could get out of that hole, anybody could. Because there certainly isn't anything special about me. Just hold your hand up. God will take it. And with God, all things are possible. You can even get sober. You can even come back from that hole you've dug. So that's my Christmas present for you drunks. And your families and your employers and everybody around you. If you're a drunk, you can be a recovering drunk. If you're extended family, they can come back. Get them to watch this video. Share this video. Spread this thing around. I want this video to go viral, not because I want my one of my videos to go viral. I want this video to go viral because I want everybody who thinks they have dug a hole so deep they can't get out of it to know, yes, you can come back. If I did, anybody can. That's about it, folks. About the only other thing I can say is what I say at the end of all my videos. Have a fantastic day. Have a great holiday season. And everybody needs to remember that the way to do that, and especially you people I'm directing this video at, may not have seen any of my videos before. But I end them all the same way, and I'm going to end this one the same way. You always just need to remember two things to have a great life. Remember that number one, the tomb was empty. And number two, he
he is alive. Hold out your hand. He'll take it and he'll help you. I'll see you all next time. Merry Christmas.